This video is sponsored by Saley. This year, Bloomberg forecast global demand for lithium-ion batteries to be at 1.6 terawatt hours. Meanwhile, Chinese firms alone have announced that they'll have about 6 terawatt hours of production capacity built by the end of that same year. That is three and a half times as much as the global demand forecast, which already assumes optimistic growth for the year. Of course, regions like Europe and North America have pledged big build-outs of their own on top of that too, which, while smaller than China's, would still be able to cover most of global demand on their own. Now, importantly, plant capacity doesn't have to equal actual production. Many plant build-outs end up failing. Even when they are built, plants don't always work at 100% output, and companies often pledge more than they actually end up building, especially when state subsidies are on the line. But Chinese battery factories were already running at just 51% capacity in 2022, and then at 43% capacity in 2023, so when they promise even more overcapacity going forward, that hardly seems out of character. As one might expect, prices have already started collapsing as a result, with Bloomberg reporting cell prices briefly hitting just $53 per kilowatt hour recently. That is a price that they formerly projected that we'd only reach in 2030 or 2035, meaning that we might be 5 to 10 years ahead of the expected price curve. And with batteries making up somewhere between 20 to 40% of the value of an electric car, the resulting collapse in EV prices has started too. While we still pay more for EVs than their equivalent combustion engine counterparts in the West, in China, the opposite became true starting in 2022 already, even before the various purchase subsidies from the government and electric car prices have only dropped since. Affordable models cost just ten to $20,000, while a nice upper mid-range one like the Xiaomi SU7, for example, starts at under 30000 Unsurprisingly then, Chinese cities already have an incredibly high share of them. I've come back to Shenzhen, where I used to live about 10 years ago, to visit some friends, and seeing the change here has been pretty mind-blowing. Standing right next to a massive street and not being completely drowned out by engine noise is definitely not how things used to be. And with the massive overcapacity driving prices down globally next, we can expect the same to start happening in the rest of the world soon, too. Volkswagen, for example, recently started offering the electric ID3 for just 249 euros a month on leasing here in Germany, which is now significantly cheaper than the 400 euros or so that you'd have to pay for an equivalent Golf. While this price drop was partially driven by Volkswagen having to meet government-imposed EV quotas, the trend is there, and it's very likely that Chinese car companies could already sell their electric cars in the West that would undercut combustion engine ones if we let them. So, how did China become the global superpower in batteries and EVs, and can the rest of the world catch up? Or should they even try? As the home of BYD, the country's largest electric car maker and also the world's second biggest battery company, Shenzhen has of course embraced an electric future way faster than many others. When I left the city almost 10 years ago, electric taxis made by BYD were already pretty common, while the city, with its population of 18 million people, actually completed its transition to 100% electric taxis and city buses around 5-6 to six years ago. While Shenzhen has been especially quick even for Chinese standards, the country as a whole also reached a very high 47% of EVs and plug-in hybrid sales already and is growing rapidly. Given that China is the largest car market in the world by far, handily outselling others like the US and the EU, and given that batteries are the most expensive component in EVs, it's clear that just Chinese electric cars in China alone have already turned batteries into a huge business. Add energy storage, which is now growing even faster than the category of EVs, and we're looking at a veritable battery boom. China, for example, more than quadrupled its battery fleet for energy storage in 2023 and passed policy mandates requiring wind and solar plants to install a certain rate of storage. But meanwhile, batteries are now getting so cheap that even market players without government support are starting huge build-outs of them even in places like Texas and Germany. And in this $130 billion battery industry, China has increasingly become the undisputed leader. Six out of the ten biggest producers in the world are Chinese, including the two largest ones by far, CATL and BYD, and China dominates every single process from making the final cells to components and also upstream processes like mining and materials refining. 
mining. The energy storage market is completely dominated by Chinese firms whose big focus on low-cost LFP technologies turned out to be a perfect match for this segment. And meanwhile, in EVs, even brands outside of China, from Ford to Tesla and Volkswagen to BMW, have basically agreed that they have to buy at least large parts of their batteries from Chinese suppliers, while some brands have gone even further. Volkswagen, for example, has bought shares in the local EV maker Xpeng and started co-developing whole cars with them, while Mazda recently introduced an EV that it calls the Mazda 6e, where the whole car turned out to be just a reskinned Chinese model called the Chang'an Dipal L7 with some cosmetic tweaks and Mazda logos. It's clear to anyone in the industry that China's dominance in batteries and also their associated dominance in EVs is almost absolute, and that the rest of the world sort of sleepwalked into a massive reliance with them. And how exactly we got here makes for a fascinating story. China's big battery story started in 2000, three years before the company Tesla was founded, and something like 8 to 12 years before the first proper EVs rolled off their production lines in the rest of the world, depending on your definitions. A man named Wang Gang gave the Chinese government a proposal. He previously studied abroad at the German university and worked on research and development for Audi, and now he urged his home country to embrace clean new energy as the leap forward for the country's automobile industry, which the state actually took seriously. He was invited back to China first to research his idea, and then in 2007 he was made the country's Minister of Science and Technology to officially implement his plan. Wang Gang realized years before EVs were commercially proven that not only would they become viable eventually, but also that China had three massive reasons to make this happen. 1. Chinese cities were notoriously covered in smog. I moved away from Beijing in large part because when I lived there, we wouldn't properly see the sun for weeks at a time and I had respiratory issues all the time. This was one of those issues that regular people actually openly and frequently complained about, which is especially dangerous for a government like China's. 2. China has long been critically reliant on oil imports. It's the world's largest importer, in fact, and of their imports, 70-85% to 85 even have to sail through the geopolitically risky Strait of Malacca. The country is obviously nervous about this dependence. And 3. The leadership was long frustrated with being simply a low-cost factory of the world, but found that especially with extremely complex industries like that of the combustion engine, it never managed to catch up to the established players and their centrally old leads. Batteries and electric cars were a potential solution to all three of these problems. Meanwhile, China also realized that it had huge structural advantages in this transformation, and that much of the rest of the world would also be particularly vulnerable to being disrupted using a sprint and marathon approach. And if you're wondering, that's not some official term, I came up with it myself, but I think it describes the process really well. Because China was so early, it had a unique chance to first sprint ahead and establish itself as a technology leader in this field, before most of the rest of the world even woke up and thought about seriously pushing back. See, in the early 2000s, batteries were seen as a fairly uninteresting industry overall, especially in Europe and in the US. Before their use in cars and energy storage, these were tiny, low-margin commodity products. The associated mining, refining, and manufacturing often also involved environmental and labor issues, so we are happy enough to let the industry migrate to countries like Japan, Korea, and especially China, together with most of electronics manufacturing. And so China could double down on this industry without it even really registering as a threat to many early on. And beside batteries, the West also completely underestimated Chinese car companies. That's not entirely surprising, given that China had famously been trying and failing to build competitive car brands for decades by the early 2000s. They forced every major international brand entering the country to set up a 50-50 joint venture, while there were also massive technology sharing agreements and many reported cases of IP theft, and still nothing really worked. The car was seen as just both so technologically complex and also so heavily reliant on decades-old brands, and the country's historic performance with both was so poor that Chinese brands simply weren't seen as credible threats. The world underestimated China's EV and battery ambitions so much that Wang Gang, for example, was happily invited to tour Argonne National Laboratory in the US to, quote, learn about chemical recipes for batteries, and was also invited by Nissan, the maker of the Nissan Leaf. Nobody was truly wary yet. While that was the case, China could sprint ahead and build up a critical lead unnoticed. Kickstarting this industry initially came from the government simply buying EVs itself, first in the form of taxis, buses, and government vehicles. Sure, there were constant complaints from taxi drivers about the lack of charging infrastructure, and much of this was far from profitable at first, but it created guaranteed demand that companies like BYD could base their EV foundations on. 
And for context, just the city of Shenzhen alone had 16,000 buses and 22,000 taxis when it went all electric, so as you might imagine, the whole country had plenty of government vehicles to give the industry an early boost with. Anyway, once the tech was developed enough, the government turned to the private market with massive incentives. Buyers of so-called new energy vehicles received direct cash subsidies, often things like priority parking and, most importantly, these green license plates, which they got almost immediately and pretty much for free. Meanwhile, the blue license plates for ICE cars in many big cities often required years of waiting, winning a lottery, and paying thousands of dollars. In many cases, this made EVs a no-brainer almost regardless of their early economics. Probably the masterstroke in this plan, though, was the government passing laws saying that those very generous subsidies would only be given to EVs that used batteries made in China. This meant that not only Chinese car brands, but also almost all the international ones like Tesla and Volkswagen adopted almost exclusively domestic suppliers in China. And since China was by far the most important EV market in the world, and also where many of the international brands built their cars for export too, most EVs from all brands, and even the ones meant for international markets, got standardized around Chinese batteries. And meanwhile, last in this sprint phase were Chinese firms like CATL and BYD going on buying sprees for mining, refining, and other upstream battery processes. They bought up and built huge capacities, ensuring that they had stable supply and could drive prices down relentlessly. And with that, this phase was done. Before anyone really gave it a thought, China owned many battery supply chains, had competitive EV brands of their own, and had even international brands from Tesla to Ford and Volkswagen standardized around their batteries. Of course, eventually, the rest of the world started waking up to this and realized that they were unhappy about their complete reliance on China. So this is when we enter stage two, the marathon. In the 2010s, every car brand already agreed that the question was no longer if EVs would eventually be dominant, but rather when that would happen and how we'd get there. The race was on, but luckily for China, they had structural advantages at this stage too that allowed them to outmaneuver the competition. Much has been talked recently about researchers finding that China has spent a minimum of two to three hundred billion dollars on EV subsidies alone, and even more than that for batteries and other related projects as well. But even more important to companies early on than the specific subsidy amounts was the confidence that the central government would pick this direction and stick with its overall support for it for decades to come. This predictability gave people the confidence to establish 200 plus firms making EVs, as tons of entrepreneurs wanted to give the once in a lifetime opportunity of a full automotive reboot a real try. Now, obviously, 200 is just way too many brands, and the first ones have already started to go out of business. But having this government-supported competitive frenzy meant that China could speedrun through three of the biggest problems electric cars have traditionally had. First, the brands very quickly made really competitive models for every segment that you can imagine. From huge, expensive SUVs, to luxurious minivans, to cars that can have their batteries swapped in three minutes, to tiny, compact, cheap cars that can drive in weird ways, to ultra cars that can somehow even jump using air suspension, every form factor and price point got covered, just in case there was a market for it. Second, the insane competition, of course, relentlessly drove prices down and, as we've discussed, made EVs now even cheaper than combustion engine cars. And third, it also partially fixed charging. Ironically, because these 200 plus brands now literally couldn't sell many of their cars unless there were enough charges for them, they themselves started building out their own networks, much like Tesla. I visited a parking lot in Shenzhen where I could see, for example, exclusive rows of chargers erected by the likes of Zeker, Xpeng, Li Auto, and more, plus even a Neo battery swapping station all in one place. These networks are a big boost on top of the public infrastructure. In short, the whole country smelled opportunity and pounced on it not only due to their own policies, but also because they realized that existing car producing nations would have structural disadvantages in making similarly aggressive moves. Our car companies are slower to electrify because they want to milk their existing combustion engine businesses for as long as possible. Our labor unions might end up with fewer jobs in an electric future, so they want to slow things down too. And our politicians fear losing elections if they push things too aggressively. As a result, we of course kind of dragged our feet on the issue. Our EVs, while they are getting better, are just a little less exciting and a little more expensive, while our charging networks are a little too sparse compared to China's too, and as a result, we're slowly falling behind China in this marathon phase. 
2024 sales data for EVs shows the results of this approach. European sales actually briefly declined by 3% last year as politicians temporarily flip-flopped on subsidies and also slapped tariffs on Chinese imports, and while US and Canadian sales were up a bit, they are at risk of slowing under Trump too. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, but especially China, is absolutely racing ahead once again with growth of 40%. Looking at this chart showing global sales by month and by country, we can see just how much Chinese sales are starting to dominate, and also that the Chinese growth on its own basically made up for all the weaknesses from Europe and the US this year, resulting in 25% global growth overall. And given how competitive Chinese EVs are, it's easy to see why. While many in the West have been disillusioned by their choice of EVs, I talked to a bunch of private ride-hailing drivers like this guy, who drove an electric car from the Chinese brand ArcFox, and they all said that they drove electric simply because both buying and operating them was that much cheaper. Given the prices and the sheer variety, you really have to start explaining why you drive anything else but a Chinese EV in China at this point. And a scary thought that you might have is that, well, sure, a lot of this was achieved by decades of subsidies and government support. That is kind of a sunk cost by now. The car companies exist, their vehicles are great, the costs are below those of ICE cars, and it's hard to imagine how this genie would ever be put back into its bottle again. This, of course, is a massive headache for legacy car brands who used to completely dominate the Chinese market, but who have all half-assed their EV transition. Volkswagen, for example, was the leading brand in China, and at some point they made around 50% of their global profits here. China was Volkswagen's country to lose, but their weak electric lineup saw them quickly lose massive share to their domestic competitors. That is a huge loss, and more important to Volkswagen's bottom line than all of its other international troubles combined. Meanwhile, just about every other legacy car brand saw similarly poor results as they all failed to electrify fast enough for China, and while Tesla did great in the market initially, by now they have started to slip too. In 2024, they fell to just 2.9% market share in the country, and they're now far behind juggernauts like BYD. And while China is clearly the first major market to become a big problem for legacy automakers, it won't be the last one. I'm in Bangkok, Thailand right now, and I think this is the exact archetype of a market that is flipping into the favor of China right now. Here, Japanese brands have historically had about a 90% market share, but that started slipping recently. BYD, GAC, Xpeng, and Co. have all started expanding rapidly. Thailand doesn't have domestic brands of its own to protect and will therefore gladly accept China subsidizing the living hell out of their electric transition. Why wouldn't they? Here too, I've talked with ride-hailing drivers who have expressed their clear economic preference for Chinese EVs, and the government of course won't mind them either. As long as the Chinese firms build local car factories to replace the Japanese ones that they are displacing, which they are already doing, it almost doesn't matter. Thailand is a large economy with 70 million people, there are many countries like Thailand, and once the cost advantages of Chinese EVs really start hitting countries in places like South America, for example, it's hard to imagine that they'd say no to them on the long term either. The world is large, and while places like Europe and the US are now protecting their own markets for now, the Volkswagens, Toyotas, and Fords of the world have loads of other markets to lose first. Now, importantly, of course, far from all developing countries are on board. Turkey, for example, which has car ambitions of its own, recently imposed 40% tariffs on their imports, while Brazil passed new rules too, which led to Chinese EVs clogging up Brazilian imports, at least temporarily, and so there's clearly a lot of pushback to be expected globally. But China is betting that time is on their side, especially when they've already reached cost-effectiveness with EVs while others are still just theorizing about it. And in this environment, having massive overcapacity in things like battery production is a kind of weapon wielded by the country's most formidable companies such as BYD. A weapon that is designed to both drive weaker domestic competitors out of the market eventually, but also one that should ensure that international firms will have a particularly rough time competing in a market that they neglected for too long. Okay, for this video and my next, I had to travel quite a lot, and my constant companion throughout all of this was my sponsor, Saley. Saley is a service that lets you easily buy eSIMs from over 180 countries just by downloading an app. No buying physical SIM cards at the airport, no dodgy Wi-Fi, just mobile data on demand even when you are abroad, and it's worked great for me. It's a single app that you can download before you even start traveling, and you automatically get connected in multiple countries. 
Plans are super cheap with Thailand, for example, starting at just $2.99. And if you use my code TECHALTAR, you even get a 15% discount on top of those already affordable rates. Modern iPhone and Android devices both support eSIMs and you just need to download the app with the link in the description to set it up in a few taps. So use my link saily.com slash techaltar, that is A-L-T-A-R, for your 15% discount that is also linked down in the description. And remember that there's also a 30-day money-back guarantee if something doesn't work, so there's no risk in giving it a try. Happy travels, and I'll see you in the next video.